Someone told me uh, he runs a day camp. And a mother came home. Well, a kid came home, actually. And the mother come, called him up, and she had a whole mesech this time, and she was extremely upset. She said, this is why I sent my kid to a from day camp. I sent him to day camp with a brand new, big, white, fluffy towel. Can you tell me why <coughs> on day number one he comes home without the towel and my son tells me that he went to the pool and when he went back to the locker room to get dressed the towel was gone. This is Yiddish kids. These are kids that have a chinach. On day number one, on day number one they saw it was a brand new towel. So the director of the day camp, he tries to calm her down a little bit. He says, maybe it just got lost. It didn't get lost. If it was lost, it would have been there. Well, maybe we'll try to find it. Can you describe the towel? I told you it was a big, white, fluffy towel. Did, did it have any words on it? She says, yes. It said, you know, day top hotel uh, at the bottom, right? Uh, uh -huh. Where'd she get the towel from? Huh? But... Uh, I remember when I was in Yerushalayim, so for a while uh, we ate by a family, it was Zisa family. Typical Meisharim family, I don't know how many kids, I don't know if they knew how many kids. And uh, <laughs> this Yerushalayim, the, you know, stops the guy and says, you know, uh, who are you? What are you doing so late at night? You know, who's your father? You're also mine. Get, get home, you know. <laughs> And uh, everybody's happy. I mean, those kids were so happy, you can't imagine. There was a smile on their face, from ear to ear. I should say, from paya to paya. Trust me, no kid sitting there on a uh, Game Boy. And no Game Boy is like an old... Uh, no kid sitting there on his computer, or on his iPhone, or on his uh, smartphone is as happy as these kids were. Just this certain Simcha Sachayim with nothing. And nothing in that apartment. I mean, it was like all these kids in a small area basically one room, you know, curtains separated the rooms and uh, there was no room for beds for most of the family so what they did was they had this like, I don't know, explain this, like a uh, plywood that was hinged onto the onto the wall and they would drop it down at night on two stilts they put these sponge mattresses on it and then the kids would sleep in shifts because there still wasn't enough for both the boys <laughs> <coughs> Both the boys and the girls. So the boys slept one part of the night, the girls the other part of the night. You know, and this is untrust me. And uh, and they always wanted Archim. Oh, they wanted Archim so badly. So the Shin Mr. Pekas Labaila didn't know what that meant. I remember once uh, the Bachim got together because they used to they, they washed these dishes in this archaic sink, looked more like a you know prehistoric pump. And uh, they, we bought them a case of plastic dishes plastic uh, forks and knives and give them a break a little bit and you know boys that came the next Shabbos they saw the glass uh, the glass again they said what happened with the case of plastic there's no way they could have used up that whole case in one week she said they tried to use it one week it was too hard to wash so they went back to the glass you know the idea that uh, you take something and throw it out afterwards that was so now there's one brother from this family uh, came to America to raise funds for something. And uh, we meet the younger brother in the mikvah, the younger brother from the family, and he's so proud. He goes, you know, his brother came from America and bought him a present, bought him a towel. In those days, in the Israeli mikvahs, you have to bring your own towel. So he, so he takes out this big, white, fluffy towel. And uh, never mind that it said property of, you know, Hilton at the bottom, but it was uh, during the season. So there was big season greetings. With a big picture of you know the right uh, Zayde there, and uh, he was so proud. He said, "My brother brought it to me from America, you know." And he's holding it up in the mikvah. We're like, mm -hmm, "Okay." I think that when we come up after 120 years, <coughs> to a certain degree, and uh, it's going to be kind of revealed who we are, what we are, when we are. We'll be holding things that aren't ours. Uh, the level of busha is going to be the same. Now. When it comes to getting into Gan Eden, so there are those that get into Gan Eden on their own merit, and there are those that get into Gan Eden for a variety of different reasons that allows them to come in. 
the, the problem here is, and really the Mepharsh should point this out, and Aral discusses it, because the Mishnah says, Kali Yisrael Yeshlem Chelek Liyadam Haba. Then the Mishnah says, Elu She'enlem Chelek Liyadam Haba. And in the Zayir it says, everyone comes to their tikkun, no such a thing. So basically, I think the Maral explains that Tzarek Kusayif, everyone uh, comes into Gan Eden. The question is, do you come in on your own merit, or do you come in because there's just some type of, at one point, after a person does his time, there's like a uh, amnesty or something. Or a person can do one good deed, and as a result he comes in, or a tzaddik promised him in something, or sometimes the tzaddik goes into Gehenna and sweeps the place out. Whatever the case may be, being in Ganeim when you don't really deserve to be there is not so comfortable. Thank you. Being uh, on, I, I had a, several criticisms on the shahakal. One person said, "Why don't you make the shahakal beforehand?" Whole shaila about Hashem's name on the tape. I never heard anyone really saying there's a shaila Hashem's name on the tape. Another person said, "Say it quietly, because then we answer amen. You're not supposed to answer amen." Another person said, "You say it so fast. Say it slow. I can't answer amen." <laughs> it's hard to satisfy Jews. Okay. <laughs> so. If a person's in Gan Eden because he doesn't belong there, but he, he, got, he got into some type of an easy pass, the lotion of the Zoyer is, it's called Nahama de Kesufa. He eats bread of embarrassment. Because Lamai says he's there, but you don't really feel good. It's like a guy's in a company, you know, because uh, they don't want to send him away, or, you know, his brother in law is the CEO, his second cousin, or uh, they're scared of a lawsuit, and that's why he's there. So you're there, but when you come to get the paycheck, there's a kind of what's called Nahama de Kesufa. You're, you're somewhat embarrassed. So you want to be in Gan Eden on your own merit. You don't want to come in uh, through some, some type of a back door. I often said the story that the, uh, one of the original rabbis, I forgot who, came in. He saw two of his Talmidim, uh, Hasidim, were learning. They were learning the Gemara that if someone saves a person, it's, 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 it's as if he saves the entire world, and he goes straight into Gan Eden for saving a human life. So he went over to him and he said, Aber nicht mit kan batsche. But not with a, the Rebbe went over to these two and said, yeah, if you save a person, it's like saving the entire world, and you go into Gan Eden. But not with a bacha. A bacha is a horse whip. So they're like, uh, not with a bacha, what does that mean? Where does that come in here? So they went over to the Rebbe, and they said, uh, explanation, please. So he told them there once was a story of a man who was like really rough, big, tough, blazing red hair, he looked like the Malach Amobis himself. Everybody was petrified and scared of him. He was a balagola, he was a wagon driver, and he would take the night job fly at 80, 90 miles an hour and uh, deliver him and if you got into a fight with him or you didn't give him a tip you wound up tied to his wagon for the next three weeks he was one rough guy and once he's doing a night job and he hears screaming he doesn't want to stop because if you stop you could be ambushed and if you're, it's hard to get a moving target but he thinks on the chance Taka, that someone's really dying he, can't, you know, he doesn't want to risk it and he stops and he gets off his wagon and he goes over and he sees a guy dying and to make a long story short he jumps into the mud and throws his ropes, and he pulls out a man, and a mother, and a whole family, and saves their lives. And really at great risk to his own life. So he comes up to, and afterwards it changed him, it moved him. And anyway, he comes up to Shemayim after 120, or after uh, whatever time he made it till his next, uh, whatever. And uh, they put all his averas on one side of the scale, and they put all the mitzvahs on the other side of the scale, and the mitzvahs didn't really amount to much. But then there was, you know, saving his family, and the the wife, the mother, the children, her children, all the schusim, and the mud, and the horse, and everything, they said, up, oh, mitzvah side, uh, tilts, off to Gan Eden. So he goes off to, uh, goes off to Gan Eden. But the problem is, he comes into Gan Eden, and he, 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 he doesn't really know all that much what to do. Like, what do I do in Gan Eden, when he comes in? He comes into Gan Eden, and he's like looking around the place, does not know what to do. Everyone is learning. You know, they're sitting there, they're, 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 they're being the Hennem a Ziva Shechina. Being the Hennem a Ziva. Someone just commented about the Shahakal. He didn't like my comment about the Shahakal. All right, that's the way it goes. And anyway, so 
You need you're sitting on Aiden, you're in the hand of Ziva Shrina, Sadiq and Yoshim Bakhtari saying the Ration crowns on their head. This guy's standing there looking around, everyone, this guy's learning Dafayami, this guy's learning Zayar, this guy's learning Amar, this guy's learning Mithil Sharm, this guy's learning Dar Hashem, this guy's learning Shulchan Arch, and he's sitting there, he's walking around the place, this guy's saying kill him. So he says, they ask him, what do you want? He goes, I want a horse whip. You know, like, hmm. <laughs> they give him a horse whip, and he's walking around the place, zets in the walls, you know, and they're looking at him like, excuse me, like, calm down, calm down. He's like, you know, what do I do here? So they said his father came, and he said, you know, we have to do something, we have to give him a tick, and so it's a whole story how he had his tick, which we'll leave part two for a different time. So the, the Rebbe said, I know, if you save a person, you save the entire world, you go into Ganeid, but not with a horse whip, you know. You have to lift your madrega, your darga, so you should appreciate uh, what Ganeidin is. I remember uh, someone telling me he got onto this uh, camp, was going to Niagara, and he didn't want to go, at the end he went on, but there was no real seat for him, and you know, he drained a hand, drained a head, but he had no seat on the bus. Every time someone went to the bathroom, he went to get his seat, and he said, I understood what it meant, Nahamad Iksufa. He's in the bus, but you know, you don't have your own seat, it is so embarrassing. You know that story, uh, one of my students told me today in one of our heated uh, discussions about size. So uh, I guess the most of the videos said beforehand, uh, so he said that these uh, three guys are sitting in the train station to see another three guys come, and all these three guys buy one ticket. You just bought three tickets. How do you three of you get one ticket? So they're watching to see what they're going to do. The first group of three, you know, the real smart ones. So he sees all three, when the conductor comes around, all three go into the bathroom. And the conductor knocks on the door and they give out one ticket to the door. So these guys are smart. So on the way back, the second group of three say, we'll do the same chachma. They also buy one ticket. And they see the first three come and they don't buy any ticket. That's what's, what's, what are you doing now? Huh? Now they're sitting on the train, the conductor comes by, so the three guys that have one ticket, they run into the bathroom. Meanwhile, one guy from the first group gets up, walks over, knocks on the door, you know, they give out the ticket, and he takes it, yeah. A few minutes later, the conductor comes by, knocking, 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 you know. It, it doesn't work. All these things, uh, they backfire after a while. You're up there, you can get onto the train, but if it's not yours, it's not yours, it doesn't work. There was a famous, in, in, if you're ever in Hebron, and you're in the famous, there's a Chabad Chalik of the Beis HaChayim in Heaven. I think it's a school that would be Mispal there. There was a Talmud of the Tzemach Tzedek. His name was of Shimon Menashe. This was Shimon Menashe. When he told the Rebbe he's going to Heaven, he wanted to go there to retire and sit and learn the rest of his life. He was a tremendous Talmud Chacham. So the Rebbe told him, Heaven needs you. I want you to become the Rav. He didn't, didn't tell anyone who he was. Him and his wife opened up a small store where they sold the material. He sat and learned. The Tzemach Tzedek followed it up and said, find him, find him, make him Rav. And they found him, and they made him rob. So he said, on one condition, I don't take any money from him. I don't take any salary from the jail. A lot of other people who wanted to become rob said, take us. We won't. You won't have to give even give into that condition. You know, like you have to. All right. In any event, he becomes rob. I don't know if that part's true, but uh, he becomes rob. And the first thing he does is Friday, people come running, and people come for Achnasas Kala, and he empties out all the tzedakah coffers, and people are still coming to him. We, they were literally starving to death, and. Daughters are sitting, and the chuppahs are being cancelled. So he couldn't take it. So he started giving away his own money that he saved up to take with him to Eretz When that was consumed, so he wanted to get rid of all the material in the store. His wife said, oh, no. So in the middle of the night, he went. He told them to meet. And he opened up the window from the store, which is on the second floor. And he stopped throwing out, you know, little those rolls of schayra. He was telling them, you sell it for this amount, you sell it for this amount, you sell it for this amount. You be able to marry off your daughters. His wife comes the next day. She sees that there's a guy stealing schayra. She should go to the police, the Turkish police. Now <laughs> go to the Turkish police. So, Arv Arv So, uh, they said, you know what? In those times, anyway. So, she's standing there with an umbrella. She's going to get this Ganif when he comes. You know, she's standing there waiting for the whack. And all of a sudden, in walks uh, this man who looks very familiar, familiar Ganif. And she's going for the wind up. And just as she's about to strike, you know, they sit the left field. She goes, Bah, it's her husband. He goes, What are you doing? She hops ready with the matzo. Well, she says, You know what? But how can I let these people die? So he pr- promised that for just uh, one night more of throwing the stuff out, and that's it, he's not going to do it anymore. So the people came to him, they still were starving, they still didn't have money for Shabbos, they still didn't have money for Achmas Eskala. So he said to them, you know what? He took out a paper, he said, go to that Gvir. So that Gvir has already had it. He's not giving out any more. They said, I am giving you a paper, he signed, and giving away 1% of my Ganeid. The guy went, 1% of the Rebbe's Ganeid, and that's like, you know... 1% will have the love Bill Gates uh, money or you know, 1% uh, share in total Microsoft stock, all the stocks, you know. Also, that's a big 1% there. Uh, 
He said, uh, I heard from Rav Kreisworth once, he said he had a shver din Torah today. There were two uh, agents over a certain diamond, and they were arguing over whether it's a half a percent or three quarter of a percent. So we asked him, for that, who was such a shver din Torah? He said, yeah, half a percent was $10 million. Depends what a percentage of. So the Gavir hears that, he, you know, he gives the guy money for Achnas's Kala. So the next day the Rebbe gives another settle, another settle. But he's holding Cheshman, a hundred settles down the road, next guy comes, he says, I don't have any Yerlam Habel left. I just gave away, I can't, that's not a joke, I gave away a hundred, um, for real. I gave away a hundred, uh, maybe it was a point of diminishing return, it was only one percent of the one percent, no, 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 I gave away one percent. So the guy starts crying, he says, help me, he says, how should I help you? He says, give away the, you know, all these stories go, and the source of the fact that he gave away his Yerlam Habel, but that he had even more Yerlam Habel. So give me away that source. So he gave away that schus. And the next guy came and said, yeah, right. he, said, he said, in the schus of giving away the schus, you, know, you probably got even more of a mama, right? So he gave away that schus, you know. Well, my son, the bottom line is, well, how this works in Shemai, who got which Shalom Haba, I don't know. But take a look at that, let's say, and you will see that this Yid was Nifter when he was 116 years old. So apparently there were a lot of schus in him over there, giving away. It's the people that are willing to give away are the ones that really have. In order to be so salanter, one said a guy got up in the middle of a machloikis. He said, he said, I swear to you, he said, I'm right. And if I'm wrong, I give up my whole oilam haba. And so be so salanter said, trust me, this guy would not give up his oilam haza. You know what I mean? He wouldn't give up his uh, Maserati, his uh, Alingba, what's it called, that car? Alang, Alanga. Well, yeah, right, the horse version or whatever it was then. That is what Oilam Haba is giving up. Oilam Haba wasn't real. But this Rav Shem Menashe was giving away something real. But I, he lived 116 years. They often said the story that there was no Esrig in Barditchev. Nothing, no Esrig to be found. So one guy passed by, he had an Esrig, the whole town like tackled him. They said, you're staying here for Yom Tif. The Rebbe should have an Esrig. He says, I'm going home for Yom Tif. No, you're staying here. So the Rebbe gave him a letter. He says, you stay here, you sit next to me in Oilam Haba. Wherever I am, you am. Good deal. So he texts, he sends an email home. Uh, in those days, emails meant on elephants, whatever, however it came. <laughs> and uh, he's saying it for Yom, he's not giving this up. Comes the first night, Sukkot. He's waiting for people to invite him. After all, he's the hero of the town. The Rebbe has an estrich because of him. The whole town will have an estrich. He notices everyone's going, Good Yom, Good Yom, no one's inviting him to their Sukkot. So he figures, you know, Kedere, the Beshutfi, like Kari, Vele, a part that belongs to partners, is never cold. And people, everyone thinks the other guy's doing it. So finally he mentions to someone, you know, I don't know where to eat tonight. The guy goes, oh, sorry. He comes out, he starts knocking on the sukkah door. He opens the door, hi. Hi, I'm the guy that saved the town. This guy, boom, closed the door. Knocks on the next door, can I come in? No. All right, let me, I have my own food. Just let me come into your sukkah, no? Can I come into your sukkah? No. He goes, what is going on? What is this, Sedoim? They said, well, the Badichev said no one's allowed to invite you in. So he goes running and knocking on the Badichev of the sukkah. He goes, Rebbe, did I do something wrong? He says, no. He says, why, why doesn't anyone take me into their sukkah? So I told him not to. So I have to be out to the midst of sukkah tonight. I didn't know to build a sukkah. I didn't know this town was whatever. I, I mean, uh, so the Rebbe said, well, if you give me back the paper that said, I promise you to be with me in Adam Hab, I'll let you into my sukkah. Mm-hmm. So he's like, that is not fair. Mm-hmm. He says, life is not fair. <laughs> and he closes the door and he's walking back and forth and he sits down and he makes a quick cheshm. And he goes, there's no mitzvah to have Adam Hab. There's a mitzvah to eat in the sukkah. So he knocks on the door again. He says, the Rebbe, here's the paper. The Rebbe says, welcome in. You can keep the paper. So he says, so why'd you do this to me? He said, if I told you you're going to be next to me in Oilam Haba, you would have been next to me. You would have been so embarrassed. He said, but now that you were willing to give it away for the mitzvah of sukkah, now you won't be embarrassed. Then. You understand how this really works. Okay, so how do we uh, arrange that we come into Gan Eden and we have hours and the emphasis in the EKG of life, there are moments like this. There are moments of frustration, there are moments of despair. And at that moment, if you hold the fort and you keep going, you got it, it's yours. One rega! In wrath. God is angry at me. Everyone's turning against me. You really want to blow it. You want to just let go. You want to take revenge. And you say, okay, Rabbi Shalom, just let me do the right thing. Rav says, that's your attitude. Chayim Bertzayna. There will be life forever after. Heard today from Yid of Schweitzer, he said he heard this from Rav Nisan Quinley, Bodlam Echayim Lechayim, that he once told him, and whatever was going on in Yeshiva at that time, so he said that he heard this, Rav Shagafayim told him the story. 
He's from Shagaf Feibel, was an amazing person, as you know, and he came to America, and he did the impossible, he made a yeshiva, made a high school, and, there was no, and he sent away his best Talmidim, he sent away to start Tells, and to start Lakewood, and Baltimore, started Tyre Masaira, and Kant uh, Sifta, and like, you know, what he did in a lifetime is beyond explanation, beyond reason, beyond imagination. Coming to America from Europe in those years. He says, if Shagha Feibel wasn't feeling well, he went to the doctor, the doctor diagnosed him, it was a god, a frum doctor, diagnosed him with TB. And there was a Rosh Hashiva in Tarvadas, he used to say, I, I don't use frum doctors. He said, because he went once to Williamsburg, there was a famous frum doctor, and he went to him, he was having chest pains, and he takes off a shirt, the doctor's in there schmoozing, him. and all of a sudden he stops with the stethoscope at one point, and the doctor's going, he goes, what, what, doctor, what? Shh, doctor, what? What, what, what? He's ready, writing his stuff, oh, it's all over, you know, like, uh, he goes, Oh, now I remember the name of that bacher I wanted to ask you about for uh, Shida. <laughs> so that's it. No more from doctors for me. Okay. So he said he went to his doctor, and the uh, doctor told him, he diagnosed him, Rahman al with uh, tuberculosis, which there was no cure those days. Not much of a cure now either, but at least it's controllable to a certain degree. And he told him, Shagha Fival, that he has six weeks to live. He said, get into bed, that's what I can tell you. So he was naturally shocked, because he was a doctor with a very good reputation. So he got into bed. So he told her, and after a half hour he got up and said, the doctor doesn't decide, the Rabbani Shem decides, I've got to do mine, let the Rabbani Shem do his. And he lived for another 15 years. He told, same story, he lived another 15 years after, uh, he told Rav Quinn, he said, that half hour that I got into bed, was the only half hour in my life that I was depressed. That half hour I was depressed. When I came home from the doctor, after that half hour I said, no, forget it, no. This is Neshtan Tachlis. Got right onto the phone, started building organizations, money, transferring money, this money, that money, this rabbi, send that this time. He was right back to where he was to start with. Whatever's going to be, is going to be. Another doctor sent him upstate, he said to be in the country here. And then another country doctor said that that lung that was affected by the tuberculosis, they wanted to suspend that lung. They didn't have any heart and lung machines, so the way they did it was the guy would go to whatever the Walmart was in those days and buy a huge sack, a 50-pound sack of manure. Okay? In those days they were still not as sophisticated as us, so you didn't have to keep ID to worry the guys would make a bomb out of it. You know, They just bought manure. For and they put it on that side of his uh, chest, so that only the other side of his lung would go up and down, and this the north. So if you want, he lived another 15 years. It wasn't because of advanced medical. Uh, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? He lived another 15 years, and he told Rav Quinn that was the only half hour in his life that he was depressed. There's two things here. First of all, that was the only half hour he was depressed, and second of all, the fact that he was able to. You know, if a guy was never ever depressed before, and he's so depressed for a half hour to be able to bounce out of it and say Giganga Vaiter. That's like, uh, that's when you buy an Olam Haba that belongs to you. Right? You say, oh, your father taught me this Gemara when I was like in first grade. And he opened up the Gemara, he says, Yesha, that Yeshayo came to Chizkiyo HaMelech, he said, Tzavel Visecha, write your Tzavar, you're going to die. Thank you. Why? He said, you were Mavatl, the first mitzvah in the Torah, the mitzvah approved of mitzvah be fruitful and multiply. He said, I did it because I didn't want to have a son in Menashe. He knew he would have a son, then he would be the next king, and he would be Mamet Selim Behechel. So Yeshayo told him, What are you mixing into Hashem's business? You do the missus. So he said, Listen, uh, Yeshayo, give me your daughter. Your schos and my schos, schos and my avais. He said, I just told you you're going to die. You want me to give you your daughter? So he spoke a little tough to him. He said, Ben Amit, son of Amit. Finish your nevua and leave. I was makabul to my father's father, which is David Amelech. I feel a chair of chodem and eches al tzavori shalad. Even if a sharp sword lies on the neck of a person, a throat of a person, al yim naatzim and arachnim. Miyad vayisyatzim ponav alakir. He turned around, he started davening, and he got another fifteen years of life. Yeah, you gotta have a lot of koyach to be able to get off. Human beings, we're human beings. We're taken aback. But after the half hour to be able to get up, you do that, then uh, all of a sudden you represent a whole different world, and all of a sudden, trust me, that's, that's not Nama the Kasuf in Gan Eden. So it says that Yeshua and Kalev, Karu Bigdayim, they ripped their clothes. What did they ripped their clothes for? So the Katsuka Rebbe says, it doesn't mean they ripped their own clothes, they ripped their clothes in a Miragla. They said, You Miragla, you are a of the people. You have, those, you have that velvet collar. You know what I mean? You have the special white socks, the silk ones. 
You have that thick silk, the wide gartel. He says, you have, you know, I don't want to say this, I heard it from a bachelor once, I really shouldn't say it. And the guy came in, he had not two buttons in the back, he had four. I said, what's the other two? He says, he has a night coil also, he wants people to know that. You know? <laughs> he says, hey! You're coming in, you're coming in here with all this rubbish of the God, and you're panicking, the world is over, and now we're finished, we're doomed, we're doomed, and rip their clothes. Yeshua Kalev ripped the clothes of these Maragla. He said, that you're wearing a Rosh Hashivah's frock, you're wearing a Rebbe, a Rebbe Bekashe, then you have to represent the Munan Betachen. Not ripping clothes. Then you have to represent that life goes on. That you've got to move on. And they were determined to move on. Did the Maragla lie? The Maragla didn't lie. They didn't lie. But MS isn't necessarily seeing what you saw. MS is finding the MS in what you see, the Katsuka Rebbe said. That's what uh, MS really means. So Yeshua ben Nun v'kalu ben Yifuna min atorah mesaretz. We were there too. We saw the same thing you guys saw. Koru big day. They ripped their clothes. You're not looking for the MS of what you're seeing. Two people can see the same thing. In this case, twelve people saw the same thing. Ten interpreted as gloom and doom, and two said, "Great." It's, 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 it's the greatest place in the world. Toiva aretz ma'id ma'id. But there's a trick. The trick is in order to see it. Toiva aretz ma'id ma'id. Ma'id ma'id, the Swarim say, is a reference to the mission in August. Ma'id ma'id have a shafal ruach. The guy comes in the Yerushalayim, his couple gets married, and the woman is there. The next morning, the Kyle wife, she's there, she's still in the Shabbat Brachas. She's looking out the window at the next lady that got married. She sees all the clothes is hanging in the alleyway there in Yerushalayim. She says, her husband's shirts so yellow. She doesn't know how to use the detergent. She just, you've got to put it in the spin cycle. No, no. I'm going to knock on her door and say, good morning, you know, we're neighbors. I'm going to tell you, we're both in Shabbat Brachas. I've got to tell you, I see your husband's shirts, and it's just not... So the husband says, do me so don't tell her anything. I have to tell her. It's going to lead to Shalom Bayes problems. And so, don't tell her anything. It's going to lead to Shalom Bayes problems. You understand that? Don't tell her anything. Don't tell me what to tell her, because it's going to lead to Shalom Bayes problems. <laughs> he says, wait till tomorrow. It's fine, I'll wait till tomorrow. Says, the next day she comes, she goes, oh, she got it straight. It's all white. He says, not what happened. She goes, what happened? She says, I cleaned our window. That's what happened. If you clean your window through Anova, then you see a different Eretz Yisro. Then you see a different thing. The Mendel of Atevsky was in the greatest Talmudim of the Hashem. The first was a Talmud of the Magad, he was a young man. My father used to share the story with me. He came in, and uh, he was sitting, his hat was like this, little, you know, to the side. So the Magad says, why is your hat to the side? He said, he just finished the whole Masechda overnight. Close it, Baal Peh. So you say, really? One Masechta? Actually, two Masechtas. So he really says, if, if with two Masechtas, your hat is off to the side, he says, let me ask you something, yeah? How many Masechtas do you have to learn so that your hat comes off altogether? <laughs> so he said, I guess it got to me a little bit, yeah? So he took him to the Baal And the Baal took his hands, and the Baal told him, the Kayach HaTayr is burning within you, it's Rizcha the Raisa. He said that the Gaiva, it didn't come across right. You're not really a Balkai. He said, you're, it's Limit HaTayr Lashma that's making you a bigger honor. And the Baal started telling him a very long story. There's a whole thing that the Magad understood half the story, and the Talmud said, yes, understood a quarter of the story, the other way around. And uh, they asked this from Nendla, did you understand the story? He said he understood it's the story of my life. And I understood it up until a certain point. Afterwards, I wasn't quite sure what the Baal was saying, but I understood that's the story of my life. And he told him at the end, you're going to be the first Hasidish in the Sea of Teretz Yisrael, Tetzvaz. And he told him, you're a shuffle of Emes, that's why I can tell you your life story. So later on, he became sick at one point, and he wasn't worried about it, because he said this wasn't part of the story. And it came time, he was like the first Hasidish in the Sea of Teretz Yisrael, so there's two uh, stories that they say. When he got onto the boat, so they say he got onto the boat to leave, whatever they left from Gibraltar, the last leg over there, we were, from Europe, so he got off the boat, on the boat, off the boat, on the boat, he said, what's the problem? So he said, I got onto the boat, I see the Eight Sahara is there. He says, what's the Yet Sahara? I said to him, you're going? I'll stay here. No, no. You go, I'll go. You go, I'll go. I'm not going with you. If you're going to come with me there. I may as well stay here. So they finally, the Yet Sahara says, okay, I'll stay, you go. He says, I come to Eretz Yisrael, I see him there. I said, I thought we had a deal. He says, no, no, no. In Chutzlar, it's those are my shluchim. He said, I'm the real thing. Okay? So, whatever said, if you were there, Eretz Yisrael, Machim, you know, the Yet Sahara gets smarter too. Stakes are higher. If it's if it's ma'od ma'od have a shval ruach in Eretz Yisrael, you see all the brachis in the world. If there's gaiva and you come to Eretz Yisrael, it's it's the miracle. You see what the miracle saw. Totally different story. 
The other story is that when he got onto the boat, he said he was frightened, and then he calmed himself down. So he said he was walking back and forth on one of the board, one of the imagine like a parquet floor with uh, strips of wood. I'm sure it wasn't a parquet floor. So he said he thought like this: if you walk, let's say you put that strip of wood, which is like two inches wide, and you put it across the ocean. He told someone to walk on it; he would fall off. But here on the boat, why am I not scared I'm going to fall off? Because there's so many next to each other. So he said, if a year is Maimon, you're not alone. You're, you're Zaydis, your future generations, your friends, and you're not scared to fall off. Then life goes on. But what did the Boshem to mean? Because he's a shuffle, the emiss, he can tell him his life story. If, you, if you're not really an un of, so, and then you hear, oh, I hear what's going to happen tomorrow. Oh, Gavaldix, what happened to Kairach? Right? He had uh, some degree of a look ahead. Oh, he met son of Enchishbainus, whatever that means. Oh, Shmuel has to come out of me. That means I'm untouchable. That means I have immunity. I can go after my Shurabeinu. It's a disaster. If you're not a shuffle BMS, knowing the future is a disaster. If you're a shuffle BMS, you can hear your life story. Then it's not a problem. The Basayim came to Eretz Yisrael. He was very down. They asked him what happened. He says that the reason I came was with great Nasiris Nefesh. He said as it was a Meshulach from Eretz Yisrael, there was a big Tzaddik, and he told me in Eretz Yisrael you see diamonds all over the place. He said, I don't see any diamonds. So he met this Meshulach, he said, you told me you see diamonds. He said, I think everyone sees the diamonds. So he locked himself in a room for seven months. Limit HaToyra and Tilim and Tefila. When he came out, he looked on the floor and said, now I see the diamonds. So he, Yeshua ben Nun and Nikola, they said, of course you didn't see Eretz Yisrael. You gotta clean your windows before you see Eretz Yisrael. If not, you don't see it. And then he went on to say like this: If Hashem wants, the Hevi was son of Eretz Azayis, and the son of one of Eretz Azayis. Now, what does this mean? You know, there's that famous marshal that a, uh, a girl knocks on the door. The only doctor in town and says, "My father's having an attack. He's choking. He's dying. Help! Help! Help!" The doctor slowly gets out of bed. Starts brushing his teeth. It's an emergency! Help! Run! He starts, you know, his mouthwash. He's gorg gorg gargling. Then he gets out. He's polishing his shoes. Are you crazy, my husband? No, no, don't rush me. Then starts putting on his cufflinks. She says, "Forget it, Hashem! Help! Help!" And the doctor goes running. So he said, "Why did the doctor go running?" So after he said, "I knew that your father's condition. There's nothing I can do for him. I had to get you to the point where you know I can't do anything for you. Once you said, "Hashem, help!" I was able to go running." Okay, it's just a marshal. If there was a real life story, the doctors are at Sayach, because you don't teach people lessons when someone is uh, is dying. And somebody told me that he was with Rav Hut, in the hospital. It was a from doctor came over. In those days, from doctors weren't as motzi. So uh, the first thing the from doctor said to him, I want to give the Rosh Hashiva, Shiva should be gesund and stark and go home. He says, do me a favor, leave the brachas to me. Look at the chart, okay? You know what I mean? Don't mix the two. Uh, <laughs> I remember once I was in the, we were someplace in New Hampshire and uh, one of my kids fell and needed stitches. So this doctor came to the emergency room that was like 96 years old. He came walking in, I said, Simonish Git. And he was holding, remember those, those little metal, you're not going to remember. Who? Mr. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to embarrass anyone here. Remember, it was like these middle, Mr. Berkowitz, you remember the middle metal boxes, those candies called Sucrets, Sucrets? What they called? Sucrets they were called, right? Came a little metal cans. And you, you took, remember it? You pulled off the cans, and the little, so they used to save those cans, the little nails, every mechanic had them. So this doctor comes, like, you know, and he takes a, one of these cans of secrets, like, opens it up, and he has this needle there, and his little <laughs> anesthesia that him in his gift, and his hands were shaking, and he was, uh, I remember in camp, there was an old youth, he was there for years, he used to give out the punch, and he's like, his hands used to, he used to scream, no one can hold their cup straight, why is this punch all over the floor? <laughs> you know? So yes, we, it was, Baruch Hashem, the, pleaded to Hashem that these stitches, you know, shouldn't stitch his two hands together, or stitch two of the kids together, you know, that were standing around, like, they didn't stand back. Yeah. It's, it's got a 98 year old doctor, you know, experience is good, but at one point, too much experience is like, uh, is, is wherever it is. So, you know, the, 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 the place is good. The uh, Rev Gifter was once, Zechel uh, Racha was once on the operating table. And the doctor came in, and, you know, just uh, right before the anesthesia, and he said something to him. And Rav Gifter said, okay, I hope Hashem should guide your hand. He goes, I don't need God to guide my hand. Rav Gifter got up with the rope and said, I'm out of here. You know, if you don't think you need God to guide your hand, I'm finding myself a different doctor. The guy's standing with the scalpel. Where? Well, what? Well, nothing doing. Nothing doing. Rav Palm, Zechut Sadiq Levrocha, when he wasn't well, and there was a question over which uh, doctor to go to, and there were different suggestions as to which treatments. Uh, some were extremely aggressive, and some were not so aggressive. So he didn't pick the most aggressive treatment. 
And they asked him why, sort of Palm in his greatness and during such a time said that he wants it, it's nothing to do with it. It's whatever the Xavier's min Shemayim. Elama he has to do a shtadless. So he holds that with this level of treatment he's Yoid says a shtadless. So why does he have to do more? I mean I mean this is like, you know, it's a person that learned Tyrol Shema his whole life that has that kind of look on life. It's it's something we can only look at from the distance. But that's the meaning of Mchafitz Banu Hashem. Hello, Miraglin! What? We're never going to be able to take over the land! Look at this huge, huge remind. Forget about it. You know, we're going to put this remind on the table, the table will come crashing down. We can't, the cloud is not going to work this way. Take it easy. Relax. Look at these grapes! Relax. It was never up to us to start with. It's in Chofitz Banu Hashem. It's going to work. It's just established in our pot. Then the Hegel Hashem Lord says, So what's your problem? You're going with the Hanukkah that was up to you, was never up to you. I know I told you the story a thousand times, but I, sometimes I need it for my own, uh, to remind myself. When I used to have my 89 Ford, which was my first, well, it wasn't really my first car. My first car was a half Buick, half Chevy. That's a different story. But uh, my second car was an 89 Ford. It was Gewaldic. It had things that my cars today don't have. Like when the kids used to jump on top of the roof of the car because it was lower, it was a station wagon. Remember station wagon? Those were good cars. Um, so it like, got indented. The, the roof. Then when it rained, it filled up with water. And then all you had to do was hit the brakes, and this, the water would cascade down the sides. It was washed the windows very freely. To car, today, cars don't have it. I remember once I was in a very bad neighborhood, and a bunch of uh, didn't look, look good that were surrounding me. And I looked from side to side for a knight in shining armor, and I didn't even find the guy with the... Uh, you know, no one was there. So uh, you, know, you hit the brakes, and all of a sudden, boom, they were splashed. Didn't know what hit them, and I took off. Uh, today's cars don't have that. So the one thing I did have with uh, with this car was I I apologize for repeating this story again, but it's just such a it's just it's just you know you gotta it's like I kept getting locked out of the car. So one day I said I'm not getting locked out of the car anymore. In those days there was no chaverim, there was AAA till they came, until they came wasn't always so AAA, and uh, I um, I made myself three sets of keys. I walked into the Hard story, I said, three sets of keys. What are you, a janitor? I said, do me for three sets of keys. you have a car rental place? No. I don't want to get, I'm not getting locked out of my car again. And Taka for two days didn't get locked out of my car. See, I never used to get locked out of my car because I would forget to lock it. But then they got this automatic beeper that locked it. That was my problem. Anyway, I woke out one day, and my wife says, I got to change my jacket. So one key went off to the cleaners, and the kid needed the bike. I gave him the other set of keys. I ran into the grocery to get a Danish. I come outside, and there's my car in the corner in the worst possible place, parked in an impossible angle. Garbage trucks, the 60th Avenue bus, all of us almost trying to go back and forth. And it was a disaster. And there was my one set of keys dangling in, and the doors were locked. And the AAA guy came and said, I didn't see it for three days. I said, you know, open the door, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I once had a locksmith. He was working forever, you know. And finally, till he got the door open, I said, what is taking you so long? He said, listen, the other door I got open, he said, in two minutes. You know, this one is taking me a little longer from the outside. Okay, that didn't really happen. All right, anyway. anyway. So, um, so I came to Yeshiva, and I said, well, what did it, was Hashem doing to me? I said to one of my fellow Rebbeim. He says to me, I'll tell you. One set of keys is irresponsible. A person is a human being, you forget your keys. He says, two sets of keys is you're doing the responsible thing. Okay, Hashem, help. Three sets of keys is a statement. God, you're not going to lock me out of my car. Hashem says, okay, we'll see. It was in Chafetz Banu Hashem. If Hashem wants, we got to do ours. So what do you mean? It's going to work. It's not going to work from Ari Leib. Uh, Steinemann said it, an unbelievable thing. And one of these meetings now, what's going to be with the Gies, uh, what's going on at Yisrael, what's going on here, and they said, if we do this, you know, if we do Israeli politics, you know, if you pull the rug out from here, this guy's going to fall, that guy's going to pop up, and we're going to turn over the whole chessboard and everything else. And uh, uh, Ari Leib, in his great Chachma, stopped, and he said, he says, you're missing the point. This is exactly what's going on over here. That if in New York, people could have trouble with bris meal. You don't understand this exam in a Shemayim, with the Rabbi Shem is out of the factory. It's all Israeli politics. It's just a, it's just a stick down here. Do you understand in a Shemayim, they're telling us something? So what, you, you, you're measuring how big these giants are? If Chavetz Vano Hashem, we do it, if not, not. Well, what's the issue? We just got to do what we have to do. I don't, I don't get the whole kasha. Says uh, Yeshua and Kalev. And the end is, this is the answer to, to, to every dying in the world. It's easier said than done. I'm going to live. I'm going to go on the trip. I'm going to have for an asset. If not, not. So what are you getting all? I just have to do mine. Yatsvis and Daiga. If you want to know how Shraga Five will only had a half hour of Daiga in his life. This is what it was. So then they go on and they say like this. They say, it's, it's, it's in the Eretz Hashu Zavas Chalavad Vash. Now, what does this mean? 
What are you telling me now that it's, uh, the, the Miraglim just said we're going to come there and these giants are going to crush us? So Kumt, and they even said the Chazakum Imenu, they spoke Mamish, what appears to be Apigarsis, even Hashem, get us through it. Unbelievable thing. Whatever that means. So Kumt, Yeshua, and Kalav, what's their sales pitch? Well, don't worry, it's an Eretz Zavos Kalav Advash. I don't need an Eretz Zavos Kalav Advash if a giant's going to crush my head there. Like, you know, I have a great place. You know, in Somalia, where all the pirates are? You put up a standard to sell Danishes, it's going to be a killing, I'm telling you. All those prisoners there, you know what I mean? They're dying for Danishes. Yeah, you're not going to last very long. What does it help me that it's an Eretz Zavas Chol of Doesn't help me if they're crushing us. So there's a very teeth of art here. I think it's the Archaim Kaddish points out that the Miraglim said Zavas Chol of and They wanted to say a little bit of MS because you have to say MS at the beginning, but if you lie to believe. They said the other way around. They said Eretz Ashahi Zavas Chol of Dvash. They, they, they said Kaddish Baruch Hu said our Parnasa comes from Eretz Yisrael. Now, when a Kaddish Baruch Hu says, your Parnassa comes to Meretz Yisrael, so along with Parnassa comes life. If the Rabbani Shem said that your Parnassa is going to come from selling Danishes in that little Somali place where the ships get captured, and there's no other place you're going to have Parnassa, and it's Meshach for you to have Parnassa, you know what that means? It's Meshach for me to be saved from the pirates. Don't you understand? He, Zavaz Chalav Adrash, your Zavaz Chalav Adrash is going to come from there. And Hashem's Parnassa comes along with the Brachais. That's the way it is, says the Archaim HaKadosh, a person goes after his bread, that's his tikkun. That's not Nama Sufa. This is where it is. See, uh, the, the, uh, there was the Risacha Be'er of Rajitz. So he once didn't have any parnasa, and people started helping him, because they saw Mamish, he was very, very poor. All of a sudden he runs into the pawn shop, and he pawns his own hat, and he goes and buys food for his family. They say, what happened? He said, I heard a Pasco. That whoever helps me now is going to have Olam Haba. Because I also want to have Olam Haba. So I have to help myself. There's a very teeth of art there. You know what I mean? We give up. You know, let everyone help me if I die. No, that, that, that's not. In the Rabbani Shalai, you know, I'll do what I can. Whatever happens, happens. The Rabbani Shalai rewards us for helping ourselves. The reward for getting out of bed after that half hour is Ganadin is your bread and Ganadin beyond anything imagine. This is Eretz Ashi Zavas Chalav Advashi. The Rabbani Shem says, you're, you're panicking now? You say, there's my Zavas Chalav Advashi, I'm gone. It's Hashem's problem how I should live, how I should survive. This is the biggest bracha in the world. There's no, if a person understands in Chafetz Manu Hashem, he can fight off all the despair in the world. You know, the Sefer Chassidim says, you should always have small change in your pocket. Because a guy needs small change. You, 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 and he needs, you know, he's, but he's in front of a meter. He doesn't have a credit card or whatever. It used to be meters, right? It used to be phones. We need small change for anyone. I don't need small change anymore. But uh, you know, a guy needs something he doesn't have. He can be the richest person in the world. What's the story? The guy's walking in the desert and he's dying and he's crawling in the sand. And all of a sudden he sees a, he can't believe it. And he sees, uh, there's, there's, there's a, he goes, is there any water here? He goes, there's a restaurant on the top of the mountain. He goes, you have any water? He goes, no, but we sell ties. You want to buy a tie? You want to get a tie now? He makes it up to the restaurant and he wants to come in. They say, you can't come in. He goes, why not? He goes, you got to wear a tie, you know, right? <laughs> you need a tie. You need a tie. You know, you know Seva Chassidim says, put yourself in a situation where you need things that people have. People, you, you know, because a person gives you a bracha. Put yourself in a situation where you're helping yourself. Yes, koina ilamai b'sha'achas. Koina ilamai. You're koina your world. So the Baraglim give this report of panic and everyone is crying their heads off, crying, crying. Shem says, you're crying for nothing, I'll give you what to cry about. So the thing is, I think it says in the Smasemis or some of the other Pelish Shesvarim, there's always Merub and Mid If you're crying for nothing, Hashem will give you what to cry about. Let's say you're happy when there's really no reason to be happy. Can you imagine how much Hashem gives you to be happy about? So the Gayana they say, Ach Bashem al Timroidu, don't rebel against Hashem, the Atam al Tiru, Sabaras Kilachmenu him. What is Kilachmenu him? Bread? Where does bread come in here? Where does the bread sell? The, the, the Rishayim say, we, we can, you know, we'll, we'll win the war like cutting a piece of bread. Not always easy to cut a piece of bread. It depends how old the bread is. We had a cook in Yeshiva many years ago. Right? Every new bread that came went into the freezer. There was no such a thing. Because it's still bread left. Nobody ate the bread because it was frozen. So we never had soft bread. So somebody once said to him, will we ever taste today's bread? He said, yeah. We said, when? Tomorrow. Right? There was a... Uh, you can cut it up. It'll be easy. The Arizal says that in every little piece of food, there's both guf and the shama. Every food has both a guf to it and the shama to it. And uh, when you eat the food, your body is nourished. When you, uh, 
when you when you make the bracha, your neshama is nourished from the food. And uh, that's what the Arizal says. So the Chassam Seifer says like this. So we don't understand what food is. Remember the story with the fish that talked? There's neshamas in food. Right? The guy said he ate lakhs Hanukkah. They talked to him for two weeks. Those lakhs in his stomach. You know, at night. You say, you know, that the, 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 nest, the ner Hanukkah burnt eight days. The, the, the lakhs burnt sixteen days. He says on it. So the Chassam Seifer says a davar pella. The Heilig Chassam Seifer says like this. He says the payers of Eretz Yisrael have a much bigger neshama than any of the payers in the entire world. The, the, the fruit of Eretz Yisrael, the payers of Eretz Yisrael, we see they're much more delicate. There's trumbas, and maizris, and chala, and arla, and bikurim, and maizrish, and maizrishayni, because they're, 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 the neshama in it is a much, it's like a kain god, has much more halachis than a regular person. And a kain, well, it's, these are, these payers of Eretz Yisrael are, are, are unbelievable. So in that time, Hashem separated the neshama and the guf of the payer. That's what some cipher says. The Paris and Eretz were just left with the guf, and the neshamas were taken, the neshamas were the mon. The Bells of the Rav was one sitting, they brought in, somebody brought him nice fruit from America. He said, that's nice. Especially in those days in Eretz Yisrael, the agriculture wasn't developed yet, they had this old shrivelly grape. He said, this is nice. Trumas, maestras, everything, this is, this is nice. So the some cipher says that in those days, the fruit in Eretz Yisrael was just the guf, the nesham of the fruit was the mon. When you see something without an neshama, just the guf, it's very frightening, it's very overwhelming. And that's why the Miraglim were very frightened when they saw the Paris of Eretz Yisrael. Because if you only see the guf and you don't see the neshama in it, then it's, it's, it's very daunting, it's very frightening, it's overwhelming. So Kaleb and Yeshua explained, because the, the only reason you only see the guf is because we have the neshama, we have the man. Ki That's our bread, it's the man, don't be scared of it. We go back into Eretz Yisrael, the Neshama goes back into that guf. It's right there. there. There's no reason to be frightened. There's no reason to be scared. So it says, you know, I went to speak someplace once. So the guy tells me, uh, you have to, I came to two hours early, he gives me a hotel room. He says, you have to lay down two hours, if not, if not I'm not paying you. So it goes back four or five years ago. So I said, what? Uh, okay. He says, what's the problem? He says, I want you to be well rested. And you got to give me your cell phone. So on my side, I tried to rest, but I couldn't because I was tossing and turning in bed. And uh, I get out of bed, and I come to him, and I say to him, you know, I appreciate your gesture. I understand. I, he said, I didn't mean to be mean. I just meant to be. I understand. I told him, you know, a human being can go to another human being and say, I want you to be rested. And he can provide a hotel room and he can take away a cell phone. But there's no guarantee the guy's going to rest. Because if something is on his mind, he can't sleep, he's tossing and turning. He says, when the Rabbi Hashem says you're going to rest, the Rabbi Hashem can give you Menuchas and Nefesh. So that's what Yeshua and Kalav meant. The Abishta said, this land is Eretz Zavaz Chalav Advash. You can't enjoy Chalav Advash if you have no Menuchas and Nefesh. And the richest person in the world can provide the Chalav Advash, but he can't provide the Menuchas and Nefesh. But the Rabbi can provide the Menuchas and Nefesh. He can do it for you. The first Medrash in this week's parasha, Medrash says, you're not supposed to go onto a boat on a long journey, and lets us three days before Shabbos. Besides for the Indian of Tchum. But the problem is, you get seasick on a boat, and you know those little bags that say for motion sickness on the plane, I don't know if they gave them out on boats, so it got complicated. You don't want to have a Fashter to Shabbos. Right? So, you, so, therefore, you have to go at least three days before that. But if you're a shliach mitzvah, you can get onto the boat right before Shabbos. So, this is one of the, one of the mafarshim and the Medrash says, if you're a shliach mitzvah, Hashem says, you'll have menuchas and nefesh on Shabbos. That's Pshat. So he says, if a person considers himself a shliach of Hashem, this is my family, this is my wife, this is my kids, this is my job, I may not be in the situation that I'm a shliach of Hashem, the Rabbi Hashem says, you're a shliach of Hashem, I can make sure you get a good night's sleep. And that's what Yeshua and Kalav were saying. It's it's Zavas Chalavudvash. And the Rabbi Shalom Zavas Chalavudvash comes along with a promise that only the Rabbi Shalom can make, and that is that you'll have peace of mind. So, Achbashem Al Timraidu. Just don't be married against Hashem. You know, um, you look in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avis, it says, Sarah Mamoris Nivra Oilam. It's great. The world was created by Sarah Mamoris. Moiridik, it's beautiful. Then it says, a sorry doyrus me noya to til noyach, to show how Hashem is marach af. Ah, what a bracha. Then Avram was mekal, a sorry doyrus me noyach ad Avram. Ah, 
Avram Avinu gets the schar for everybody. So positive. So in the siyoynis, in the snasu of Avram Avinu, Avram stands up to all the siyoynis. Amazing. A so in Nisim happened to Avisenu and Nitzrayim, a so makas and ten on the yam. Wow, it gets better and better. These, these are so in bracha, bracha. And it says all the so in Nisim in the base of Migdash. And it says a so in Nisim, the snasu of Avisenu by Midbar. Givaldik, you blew it. Where does that belong in the Mishnah? How does that fit with the other ten? We blew these ten sins. Kedush Shemim once met someone. He said, "Why you know why you look so depressed?" He says, "I don't know." He says, "After the shulis, it just hits me so hard." He says, "Baloischa the mesoinim and meshlach the meraglim and 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 kairach is kairach and bolak the nice shita." In those days, that's what he was depressed about. I don't think anyone was coming to a psychologist now and says, "Baloischa shlach kairach is kairach to me." I don't think we're on that level here. So the Kedush Shemim explained to him. He says, "This is the cycle of the world." You see, the Mishnah puts that in the same row. Because we, we get into a rut, and you pick yourself up, and you get out of it, and you go weiter. I think there's a member from the Divrei Chaim that the Dara Midbar, the Gemara says they weren't worthy to sin. It was under the Horus Chubal It's like a vaccination, antibiotics. You know, you inject, some of the, you inject some of the venom, some of the poison into the person, so he develops the antibodies to fight it. That the Dara Midbar had to face all of these nesyoinists, all of this panic, all of this, it's all over, we're doomed, it's gone, it's doomsday, even Hashem is not, not interested in me. You had to go through this whole process, and then they had to fight their way out of it. So, how did they fight their way out of it? What happened after the Chet Maraglim? For 40 years, what did they have to do on Tisha B'av? The whole Dar Hamidbar had to go dig a grave and sleep in the grave overnight. Some woke up in the morning, some didn't wake up in the morning. Wow, what a tishaba. You didn't need uh, you know, some uh, special chizik or panel to get people into the mood of tishaba. But you understand that this was the ticket on the Chet HaMiraglam. Because everybody went to sleep at night and they said, there's nothing we can do. Im Chafetz Manu Hashem we live, if not, not. They totally put their lives into the hands of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. They did this for 40 years. This was the tikkun on the Chet of the Miraglam. What happened, right? Chemeshasa Ba'av is a Yom Tev. Why is it a Yom Tev? Because they saw they were getting up. They got up in Tisha No one died. Oh, must be a mistake in the calendar. Full moon. No mistake in the calendar. No more dying. Frank Tysus. Wait, 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 wait a second. Who was supposed to die? The 600,000 people from the Dar Hamidbar. Over 40 years. That's about 30,000 people a year. So, who were, these, who were these last year, these last people that didn't die? The Manav Shech. If they weren't from the Dar Hamidbar, Meaning they were the next generation. They didn't go into the grave to start with. And if they were from the Dar Hamidbar, so besides for Yeshua and Kalev, everybody was supposed to die. So who was it that got up? And therefore, Chemesh HaSabayov is a Yom Who climbed out of the grave? So the Chedush Yerim says, Adar Repel. He says, everybody got into the grave, and they talked and said, okay, we're in Hashem's hand. But in the bottom of their hearts, they were saying, look, 600,000 people, only 30,000 are going to die. What are the odds? It's me. The other guy is going to die. Like the Chavetz Chaim said, there's a Chevrish Tarvis. Second year, okay, odds are a little worse, but still, up until one before the last year, year number 39, 60,000 people get in. Okay, it's going to be the other guy that's going to die. I mean, that's push it. You know, the last year, these 30,000 people guy looked at each other and said, there's no one left to die for us. You know? They said, I said, help! The sense is one you say that 40 years ago! Take your in my hands. So they all got up, they all lived. They all uh, got up. It's, it's, it's one of the, the truths of Tyson that 30,000 people lived. Tyson asked that cash. You know, and once we had a story that uh, in World War II, they dropped these uh, hundreds, thousands of paratroopers into enemy lines. And the intel- it was the first time it was really done on such a massive scale. And they argued, you, you're sending us to die. Drop into We don't know where we're going to land. We're all alone. No, the intelligence said, we're going to tell you exactly where you are. And they built huge cities. You're going to see it exactly. You'll be perfectly trained. So I read this soldier drops down, you know, from the, from the plane. He said he lands in a swamp. There wasn't supposed to be a swamp there. He gets out, he goes into a thorn bush. There wasn't supposed to be a thorn bush. He tries to make it to the road. There's no road there. He's supposed to hide in a barn. There's no barn there. Whatever the intelligence said, this is and this is So he's so angry. He wants to write a report to this intelligence. He wants to say we're finished. It doesn't make sense. He wants to curse. He wants a lawsuit. He wants this. He's going to sue uh, Vice General Eisenhower. He's this. So he meets another paratrooper and he's all. He says, listen, you have a choice now. Either we move on and we deal with what we have to, or you're going to stay here and write your report until the Germans kill you. There's no time to complain now. Now's the time to move on. He said, you know, I don't have to understand what's happening. You have a half hour to be depressed afterwards, you get out of bed. So Rabbi Schlegel Feibel did it in a half hour, so we have to do it after a day. We didn't do it after a day, we're depressed the last ten years, so fine, get up now. Whenever it is, get up now. 